Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of Barcelona BHH series. My name is Aline, and I'm the Chief International Officer of Barcelona Health Hub. So today we're going to talk about mental health. So how to stay mentally healthy in a situation like we are at the, 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 the moment. So we're going to talk about confinement, about working from home, like being connected to your team, about mental health in, in general, about the, the, the healthcare um, workers, uh, etc. And today to talk about this topic, I'm accompanied by four experts in the field. So we've got Pablo, the VP and Gen General Manager of Health at Headspace, Alberto, CEO of Wemby, uh, Ricardo, Chief Medical Officer of SIUS, and Manuel, the founder director of CAT uh, Barcelona. So I'm going to ask each of you to present yourself briefly. So tell us like who you are, what your company is doing, and briefly what you've been doing those past weeks in the context of the COVID-19. Pablo, do you want to start? Sure. And uh, thank you, Aline, uh, for the invitation. I'm so so glad I can I can join since originally I'm from Barcelona, uh, but now I'm based in the U.S. in California. Um, I'm, I'm at Headspace where I lead the, the healthcare business and within Headspace, we, well, Headspace is the lead science-based mindfulness solution. So we have over 63 million people in 190 countries and uh, 25 peer-reviewed published studies. Um, and then we have three businesses, the consumer business and direct-to-consumer, the B2B business where we are offering Headspace to employers. We have over 650 um, companies um, offering Headspace, some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies, and then the third business is the healthcare business, the one that I'm at. And because of COVID, uh, mainly we did uh, two things. So one is offering some of our most used content for stress and anxiety and also for sleep and make it available for free. So we're a subscription business, but we made some of our content available, a pack called Weather in the Storm. So all of you, you can go to the App Store, you can download App or, or Google Play, and download the app, and you can use the content. And from the healthcare side, what we did, it's offering full access to Headspace to all the healthcare professionals in the US until the end of the year free access to all our content, over a thousand hours of content. And we also did this with the, with the NHS in the UK. Perfect. Um, Wendy? Hi. I'm Alberto, the founder and CEO of Wendy. And uh, Wendy provides uh, online counseling and mental health coaching uh, to people organizations. During uh, these times, uh, what we are trying to do is to put together uh, an offering for uh, medical professionals to uh, receive uh, online counseling for free. So uh, we already start to mobilize our own team and we are expanding uh, with uh, a team of volunteers to provide uh, uh, hours of counseling uh, to hospitals, clinics, uh, and uh, nurses and doctors and uh, people being uh, on the front line of this epidemic. So one day we specialize uh, for caring for the carer. So uh, we provide services initially for NGOs and we are expanding as well uh, with uh, uh, corporate law firms and service providers uh, at large. Our expertise is generally like uh, giving help to tools uh, in um, the most difficult situations. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Sayus? Hi, I am Ricardo and um, I am a psychiatrist. I did medical school in Barcelona and then moved to the UK in 1998 to train as a psychiatrist there. I did my clinical training at the Motsley and I got a master's in research methods in psychiatry and a PhD in neuroscience at King's College. And I worked as a forensic consultant psychiatrist in the NHS for 17 years until 2016 um, when I moved to industry. I worked for a pharmaceutical company as a European medical manager for neurology and psychiatry for three years. And I joined SIUS in October last year as the chief medical officer. SIUS is a company that specializes in creating a virtual reality environments that are presented in a platform like a subscription service and are used as tools for, by psychologists and mental health professionals. 
we um, when 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 the pandemic hit us, we realized that there were two main difficulties that we were facing. The first one was the inf infection risk posed by sharing the virtual reality equipment. And the second one was the distancing between patients and physicians. So we decided to prioritize those two and we focus on patients first. So first thing we did is to create a Android app called Sayus at Home that allows the patient to connect to the patient's platform remotely. Very similar to what Headspace done, we have also offered two free content, one for mindfulness and one for relaxation in the app. With that in mind and solving the problem of mental health patients accessing services, we then thought about a clinical network. We received a, um, um, uh, petitions from a psychologist that wanted to help but didn't know how. And we identified that the main point of need at that point was the um, uh, frontline healthcare workers. So we created two um, uh, patient support programs, Cuidate en Casa and Stray, Stay Strong at Home, by which we are offering a thousand therapy sessions for free to healthcare professionals through this. And then we decided to focus on the, on the third aspect of the confinement, which is what you do when you're at home. And when we've launched three clinical networks, one in Spain, another one in UK and the US, and the third one in Latin America. And we are delivering training sessions in the form of webinar to a psychologist. And our clinical network psychologist is also doing training sessions for the public in general. So this is, this is what we're doing. And we've, we've done that in, in two and a half weeks. <laughs> wow. Manuel, do you want to tell us about you? Uh, thank you for inviting me, Aline. Uh, my name is Manuel Masbaga. I work as a psychiatrist. Uh, I studied in Universitat of Navarra. And after uh, my specialty was in, in, in Barcelona and later in Yale University in the Connecticut Mental Health Center. Um, I'm running uh, three clinics I founded in 1986, uh, specialized in mental health. We started in, in addiction, uh, but after uh, we run uh, programs of uh, obsessive compulsive uh, problem with schizophrenia, with dual diagnosis, and uh, most of the uh, mental health uh, problems in adolescents and basically um, um, adults. We are running in, in terms of rational emotive behavioral therapy. It's a cognitive intervention. We are supervisor of the Albert Ellis Institute. So we are very in touch with, with this uh, institution. And we introduce uh, for, for parents and for families since the confinement uh, tools for working and, and to maintain the treatment. We have 90 beds, so the people who, who are who are in touch with, with us and uh, as a patients are very vulnerable, vulnerable, and so we have to continue working with them and with their families. So we know that this epidemic is increasing the, the stress, the anxiety, the depression, in, not in all the general uh, population, but in our patients. So uh, we have to, to have a 50% of the team uh, in, in presencial, and 50% at home and manage uh, the in individual therapy, the group therapy, all the intervention, uh, taking part on the different pharmacology. So working these this weeks to maintain uh, the contact with the patient, but at the same time uh, to care for all the professionals that are in the front line in, in, in our team. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much everybody for those, those uh, short uh, presentation. So first, I would like to talk about uh, confinement. So here in Spain, we've been confined for um, more than three weeks already. And they, they just announced that we're going to be confined a um, couple more weeks. So it's, it, it's, it's accumulating. Uh, it's not always easy like, to be at home and a lot of people are alone. Uh, you have also to manage like, all the, the anxiety coming from all sides, like all the, the news coming from, from outside for what's happening. Um, in the hospital or to, to your family, etc. Um, so I think it would be nice to, to talk a bit about like concrete actions, like all the people who are listening today, 
what can they do? What can we do at home um, to make the most of that time? Uh, so I remind you that we've got the, the chat. So if you want to ask a question to the, to the speakers or if you want to make a comment about the topic, you can do it in the chat. And we're going to pick the question and address them um, during this, this hour. Try to address uh, most of them if we can. Um, so first, let's talk, let's talk about mindfulness. So I think that's something that's um, maybe less known here in, in, in Europe, for instance, than in Asia. Um, like Pablo Headspace is like a mind, uh, mindfulness app. Can you tell us more about what is mindfulness and how can we use it at the moment in this uh, confinement period? Sure. Yeah, like you said, it's it's well known in Asia, and, and we started ten years ago, actually in the UK. Our two founders are a, a former Buddhist monk and um, a former media exec. So, um, Andy, the former Buddhist monk and the voice of Headspace, he started in an integrative medicine clinic in the UK, and then Rich, the CEO of Headspace, was his patient. So, and actually experiencing. Um, the, the, the effects of mindfulness himself, he was extremely stressed and living with anxiety. Then he wanted to other people to experience the, the same thing. And, and again, over the years now, and 10 years since we launched Headspace, um, well, it's, it's been proven, the effect of mindfulness in terms of um, stress reduction, anxiety, um, increase. In, in our case, we also have evidence in terms of increasing compassion, increasing focus just for one session of headspace, for example, increases the focus by 14%, uh, increasing happiness, uh, reduction in depression symptoms, uh, also in the workplace. Uh, I know that now we live in a kind of a weird moment where we work from home, but but definitely all these are, are the effects of mindfulness. And, and when people talk about mindfulness, of course, it's meditation, but it's also beyond meditation in our case. And we started with meditation, but we have a lot of content in sleep now. And a lot of our users come for the sleep content and help you to sleep. And we have specific content also for insomnia and MBTI course. Um, as well as content for, you know, um, mindful walking and um, mindful, you know, again, now weird times, but mindful eating. So it's, it's about, you know, being present and thinking and, you know, what you're doing and just let your thoughts come and go rather than sticking with, you know, with, with the thought. But um, I just want to say I'm, I'm not a clinician myself, so definitely, you know, maybe uh, Ricardo, you can you can go on the uh, or Manuel, you can go on the on the clinical side. Well, maybe Pablo, before for movement, can you tell us like if people wanted to use a Headspace today, uh, how many times a day, how long, how, 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 how does it work? Good question. I think um, all our studies are based in at least um, ten minutes. Um, we we recommend ten minutes every day, whatever if it's you know in the morning, ideally, but whenever you have a moment. Um, so, but ten minutes at least three times a week, uh, you can see the the effects. Um, and way better if you can if you don't have the time. If you think, hey, I'm busy to do this, way better than just to we have even five minute meditation or one minute exercise to focus. And so it's better to do, you know, even if it's just one minute or three minutes every day, rather than do, we have up to 20 minutes for the, the ones that are most more used to, to mindfulness and way better to do five minutes every day than 20 minutes, you know, one day a week. Okay, great. Um, Ricardo, do you want to comment on that? Because I know you're also offering mindfulness through the device, like the Psyus device, the VR. Can you, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear. Uh, yeah, sorry about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, we do have environments for mindfulness, and I don't think I can add a lot to what Alberto has already said. There is a page if anybody is interested in in checking the NIH, the National Institute of Health. Um, um, it's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. I can send you the link through the chat, and in there you've got or a repository of the scientific evidence that backs up mindfulness as a therapeutic tool. I, I would say two things, uh, which is sort of stressing a couple of points that Alberto has already said. The first one is that it's safe. 
um, it's considered to be safe for healthy people, so there are very little risks in, involved. And also um, that um, is, is a habit, is a mindset. It's not an intervention that will deliver a solution to your problem immediately. It's something, it, it's a way of training your brain into achieving a state of wellness that will permeate in every activity that you do. So you can find peace when you're eating, you can find peace when you're walking, or you can find peace when you're shopping or when you're dealing with your kids. Um, in Sayos, with a, a mindfulness environment, uh, we, we put them there with the idea that people will use them to meditate. But what we've seen is a tremendous uptake transdiagnostically. So we have a group of um, psychologists that work on psychological prehabilitation. And these people are working um, with patient population as varied as oncology patients or pediatric populations undergoing lumbar puncture. And what they've seen is an improvement of, of anxiety and depressive symptoms and an improvement in the post-operative state. So they recover quicker and they um, and faster. Uh, than if they if they are not exposed to mindfulness, so it really is a fantastic tool. And and half the sessions that we deliver in in our platform are mindfulness sessions. So really really useful. Okay, fantastic. Um, also, so question for all of you at the. Yeah, let's just yes yes sir, an appointment. I I, I agree uh, with both of you. We we highly recommend mindfulness. In fact, we have in, uh, integrated as a tool in, in our patients, both in the residential and in our patients. So I think it is very important, very interesting uh, for people like attention deficit hyperactivity, retrocode record uh, is, is, uh, and this talk is, is very interesting. We are using research into yourself, Davidson and, and, and Goleman, but it's mostly like, like uh, uh, Ricardo, and, and I think that for people, just for adolescents and for, for personality disorders too, it, it's working very well. So uh, even five minutes or 10 minutes and doing at home or, or connected with, with the people is, is good. We are now doing a yoga uh, by internet too. Uh, we have a person outside that's, that's doing it. It's, it's great. It's, and the people connect very much uh, at this moment. No? So they are able to, to continue working with themselves uh, it, it's not the same as mindfulness, uh, like meditation, but it's part of the program uh, more than cognitive or behavioral or, or emotional tools. Perfect. Um, so when we started the confinement a few weeks ago, um, some specialists were insisting on uh, the importance of adding a, a routine. Can you comment a bit on that? Um. Uh, Sorry, go, go, Mano. No, 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 just uh, for starting, I think that the schedule uh, during the confinement is very important. Uh, we have seen in our patients that we have to continue the structure from, from eight in the morning to six in the evening, and they manage much, uh, much better than during the weekends that there is no so much structure. So people in confinement, we recommend uh, a structure, uh, meaning uh, time for for reading, time for being with the family, time for wake up, time for for uh, for TV, uh, uh, someone, but not not especially uh, in this way, and 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 maintain these routines during the day, even seven weeks, seven days a, a week. I think this is one of the good points. And introducing, as we said before, a mindfulness as a part or an an physical exercise. Uh, at home is possible too. And nutrition for preventing eating disorders, that will be uh, some of the tools we, we, we can discuss just for introducing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, no, it's very interesting well, just wanted to add uh, as an entrepreneur uh, being confined uh, in my site, like I say, what keeps you going is a pretty uh, straight routine. That includes as well as I'm an avid yoga practitioner and a meditator since like many years. So uh, I definitely can relate with what you are you're commenting. Fantastic. Uh, actually, I actually have a list of things that I that I wrote down um, for this. So the, the first thing that I would say is don't panic. 
right? Um, um, we don't make good decisions when we are in panic mode. There, is the, there are cognitive bias that play a role when we're panicking. Don't, don't, don't have fear either, because you might be able to make some good decisions, but by the majority of them will not be very, very, very good. The best thing to do is just keep calm, keep calm, and, and, and be mindful that what we are dealing with is a transitory aggression from the environment. It's lethal, it's dangerous, be respectful with it, and be careful. But don't let fear or panic cloud your decisions. The second thing is about information. One important thing, and we keep having this contradictory information from everywhere. And I think the important thing is to focus on practical information. When is the state of alarm going to be lifted? When can I go? Can I travel to see my mom who's unwell? Can I travel to buy things? Just focus on those practical um, um, bits of information. The next thing is about modeling. Um, if you come, if you act, coherently and if you make good decisions you are modeling that behavior to the people that you're living with and and this is particularly relevant for for us with young children if if your children see you panicking they are going to panic and the whole thing is going to escalate so just model that behavior routine i agree entirely it's very good to keep a routine that includes exercise and good nutritional habits but it's also important not to be very strict with your routine because these are not normal circumstances you have to be a little bit flexible you have to allow for your children to misbehave from time to time you have to allow maybe not to wake up every day at 7 30 one day you might want to lie until nine but do it you know because these are not normal circumstances keep the communication open and 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 connect with people we used to have all this Instagram and Facebook groups and Telegram groups and all that sort of things to connect with people that were not related to a day-to-day -day lives. And those people have now been removed. So use those channels to connect to these people. Don't follow Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, he's, he's a great guy. But at the moment, I'd rather follow my brother than Arnold Schwarzenegger. There will be a time in which I will hook up with Arnie again. But for now, I just keep a very close contact with the people I used to, to be every day with. And, and, and the, the last two things is keep up, keep up the hope, you know, just send messages of hope. This is going to end. It's not going to last forever. We're going to come out with a lot of new learnings and a new teaching, having known your partner and your children, knowing the strengths and the weaknesses, having taught things, learned things from them. And the last thing, which I think is very, very important, is try to help somebody. I mean, we, we are isolated, but doing things like this, you know, participating in a webinar, sharing your knowledge, sending a message, asking whether anybody needs your help, it will make you feel that you're contributing to something. So those, those are my, my, my tips for, for sort of Fantastic. Very period of confinement. Yeah. Pablo, do you want to add something, maybe? Uh, yeah. Go, go, go ahead, Pablo. No, go, go, Alberto, please, go. Okay, thank you. No, just wanted to uh, quickly add on, on Ricardo. He's uh, quite exhaustive. Is uh, a uh, focus on what you can control. Is uh, we are in a situation in which most of uh, the things uh, we used to be under control uh, are not. They move them beyond our aspect of control, and this must generate frustration. But if we focus on what we can control, we can reduce this frustration and. Uh, and basically get back and operate in a different way uh, in our everyday life. Keeping in mind, uh, as Ricardo said, that is also is, is going to pass and uh, is impermanent, like uh, basically everything in this, in this world. So please, Pablo, go, go ahead. I just wanted to add this, uh, this little comment. No, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what you both said. Um, but I just want to reinforce one thing that um, Previously, both Manuel and Ricardo said, I think it's about, um, and this is coming back to the integrative and medicine approach. So it's not just, hey, meditate and that's it. So it's about, hey, meditate and doing whatever, you know, yoga exercises or small exercises at home, which is really some content for, you know, a movement content that you can also do at your home and then mindful eating. So it's just kind of the, and all the aspect, this, this holistic and integrative approach. It's not just about, hey, no, if I, if I meditate, you know, 10 minutes, then that's it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. No, it's about training your, your brain. 
um, rather than um, and and with all the different elements. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with that. Just one point. According to Martin Seligman, the founder of Positive Psychology, the forty percent of our happiness depend of us not the activating events, not the the COVID and at this moment. So, so we have a lot of uh, opportunities to work with our emotions and, and with these different tools we are we are taking, we are tailing, uh, improve our happiness. I, I think it's very uh, important. We, we have the opportunity to work on with the, our, on these uh, emotions, no? And and I, I would say that what we don't have to do is. Uh, take analgesics in terms of uh, uh, drugs or alcohol or uh, st stay in, in TV series for hours and hours. Uh, I think this was uh, our point that uh, are against this confinement. So uh, we are talking about tools, positive tools uh, and negative tools, uh, tools that are good for adapting to this uh, scenario that is, uh, is as we said, in cognitive uh, approach is, is not the end of the world, even that it, it, it looks like. It's 100% negative, not, but not 150%. So disputing our irrational beliefs is part of the, of, of the work we have to do uh, with, a, with us, with our families, with our friends. I agree very much with, with staying in touch with the different WhatsApp group or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Ricardo, something you mentioned before, you mentioned the kids. Mm -hmm. So now the situation is that a lot of people, or most of us, like, are working from home. So you have, you're, you're confined with the whole family, you have to combine working, with, you have to take care of the kids that they don't really understand what's happening. Some of have like very young kids, like how can you combine all of that? What tips can you give to people at home? Well, um, it, 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 working? it, it it really depends on the age of your children. If you have very young children, if, you know, children under the age of six, they, it will be very, very difficult for them to understand what's happening. So the, the main thing that you could do is keep them distracted um, and find them something useful other than the television to do, change activity frequently um, um, so they are entertained. And if you have a balcony or if you have some outdoor space, allow them to go and play out there. If you don't, then then you can do it, but, um, but, but it's going to be difficult with toddlers. With uh, pre-adolescent um, teens, it's uh, easier. Most of schools have set up um, distance learning programs, and from nine till three or from nine till four, they, at least my children are engaged in, in Google Meets and Google Classrooms, and they have their homework, and, and they have a structure to the day. Is in the afternoon where I have to take over and maybe I have to do some exercise with them or I have to um, cook or to, um, you know, some, do some activity together. So I, I think it depends on your family structure and depends on, 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 on the age of your children as well. But the most important thing is what I said earlier. I think for me, the, the important part is to model to them that this is not a panic situation. That is something temporary and it will pass and, and ask them to get into a mind frame in which you look for opportunities rather than um, to focus on the negative. So, you know, my, my children, one of them wants to learn to cook and the other one has, with their friends, had started a knitting group. These are skills that they didn't have and you can, you can buy all this in Amazon, you know, deliveries are still working. So there's plenty, plenty of things that you can do with them. Interesting. Um, Alberto, do you want to comment on that, maybe? From your experience at Wemby? Yeah, so it's, uh, I don't have small kids, so uh, <laughs> yet, at least. And uh, uh, we, we provided a webinar uh, just last week on uh, uh, dealing with small kids, uh, uh, especially for one of our clients. And uh, it uh, had a pretty, pretty positive reception. And, uh, and it was requested you know, as uh, one of the, um, of, uh, the key things of uh, learning how to do in confinement, especially the challenge of uh, working, having small kids uh, uh, at home. Uh, it changes completely the environment. It creates distractions. And, 
and obviously like uh, this adds an additional layer of stress no? to uh, to the parents they just still need to keep going with uh, the, the job no? and getting uh, and getting things done so I, i'm not going to get in, in, in depth into what it was recommended like uh, we got two psychiatrists here for that no but uh, uh, basically uh, is a uh, balance no, is uh, trying to find our balance, if it's possible, getting a place uh, within the house that is for work and, uh, and trying to keep that uh, uh, separate. Not everybody has this, um, this uh, uh, option. No? Uh, one of my advisors was commenting that uh, uh, she used to work for a large uh, accounting firm, no? and there is a big difference if uh, you know, you're a partner and you have a, a comfortable accommodation and you do a team meeting with another 50 colleagues, then you've got the trainees and the more junior people that perhaps live in a share flat. They don't have a, a different locations to, uh, uh, to work, to be in private. No? So do what you have uh, and, uh, and trying to, to deal as well with the kids. I think it's a, it's a very good moment to take out that video no, of, uh, I think it was the CNN uh, uh, a journalism that had their kids uh, uh, breaking into the, uh, the meeting room. No? Like uh, he was giving the, the decoding from his house, it went viral. I think that is a quite an example of how uh, we can just take it the way it is, as a, as a situation in which we are right now. No? So, and another request that we are having, for example, like is dealing with uh, uh, the partners. So we believe with our partners, uh, and uh, but you know, still we're not twenty four seven. We got our life as well uh, uh, that is uh, happening around, but now it's, it's different. It's twenty four seven. The conflicts, the space. Uh, uh, there's not any more uh, separation. So these some uh, of other requests that we are getting from our clients on topics they. Uh, on, or as well uh, dealing with teenagers. This is a particular uh, uh, space uh, for kids. I don't know if, uh, if uh, Ricardo is going to add on that since I, I got to understand that you might be target group. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the management of conflict is a really, really interesting um, topic in this situation. Um, I, I only have, um, I mean, the only, the only thing I would say about this is if the conflict is transitory, so you're, you're annoyed with your kid or you're annoyed with your partner for something that he or she or they have done, um, the best thing is not to react in a knee-jerk fashion. Just keep your, keep, keep your calmness and, and say to the person, I don't like what you've just done because of this and I want us to take some time to think about this and then we'll come back and discuss about this. So ab avoid heated arguments. This is not the time to have them. And my kids go to the room and I go to mine and then we meet in the kitchen and said, you know, do you understand why I was annoyed? And they say, yeah, what could you have done differently? And then you discuss the situation with, with less intensity. The other, the other conflict that you were mentioned, the conflict with your partners, um, this might be the time to reflect on whether life with that person is what you want to do. But it, it, it's probably not the time to bring this up because you can't go anywhere. I'm not saying forget it. I'm saying pack it, elaborate, a structure, write it down. And when this finishes and you're out and about, you say to your partner, actually, during these two months that we've been confined, there's a few things that have occurred to me that I want to discuss with you. And bring up the conversation then, because now is not the time. So th those would be my advice. I don't know if, if Manuel as a psychiatrist would like to add something to this as well. But would, wouldn't the, the, the actual situation with provoking those behaviors or reactions and in normal situation it wouldn't happen? Say, say that again. Like, this, you say like if a conflict happens with someone, yeah. in a normal situation, it wouldn't happen. It's just the fact that we're in confinement and with the situation happening, that provokes the situation. Exactly. So, so we, we have, I mean, we need to understand that now we have time that we didn't have before, right? We don't have to commute. We don't have to rush to things. It's all in here. So the rhythm of life has changed. We need to adapt to this new rhythm. So that means taking things, you know, it's going to take a longer 
I mean, uh, with, uh, with even even menial tasks like cleaning your house, you can spend the whole day and make sure that you do a really good job and enjoy spending the whole day because you don't have to rush out to go to the countryside at 11. So, so the circumstances have changed. That Those circumstances are imposing a different rhythm to us and the way we reacted to conflict before cannot apply it entirely exactly the same in this situation. You have to adapt the way you react to conflict before to the circumstances that you're now. So there is the, 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 your reaction have to be appropriate to your environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, 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 I would agree. And, and, and as we know, uh, the anger uh, in the conflicts or the projecting the uh, frustrations through others is, is, is part of a uh, daily, daily basis in, 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 in clinic, but in, in family too. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I have, uh, my son have 28 and twins of 22, so I can marry with him and uh, with them. And uh, that's, I think the problem sometimes is the, the intrafamiliar violence we can see in the clinic and in a small uh, face in, in, in maybe our, in our families, but in, in general, uh, gender, gender violence or, or adolescence with, with parents and this real, a, a, a real problem because sometimes they, they feel like they, they cannot manage and some, some of them can be in, the, in, the, in, in, in medication, but in, in, in four, uh, four walls are difficult to, to manage. And, and, and so is a way to maybe the telemedicine stay in touch to ask for, ask for, uh, for help, even, even by phone, even by internet. Is, is, is a good way too, because uh, we can consider that, that stay in touch with our friends, as we said before, and try to manage intra-family the situation, but look for, for professionals too, uh, it's a good way, because sometimes it happened to us that people was scared about uh, the uh, infection and take their children or the, the, their adults at home, instead of the clinic and they are having a lot of problems because they are not able to manage the situation. No? But uh, working in, 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 in family therapies, we are doing family therapies too, or doing uh, group therapies, connecting with different peoples could be a, a good way even in these moments to, to manage the situation. And pharmacology too. Sometimes uh, we need pharmacology, and uh, one of the problems is abusing again, as we said, alcohol or drug or or, or abusing uh, medication. But sometimes it's, it's it's okay to work with the with the different professionals and increase if it's necessary uh, pharmacology or reduce or or, or stop uh, for preventing these these situations. Perfect. Um, I'm going to take a few questions from, from the audience now. Uh, so one question is about, uh, so m we talked about mindfulness before. So mindfulness is just one way of relaxation. Um, but like, how can you compare the pro of the cons of the different re uh, re relaxation methods? And if you don't know uh, about mindfulness or med meditation, as we mentioned before, it's not maybe not so common here in, in, uh, in Europe. And that's maybe a different meaning than in Asia. Uh, how would people know what's good for them and if maybe the right thing for them? Pablo, maybe do you want to start? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is, and I think Ricardo kind of mentioned this, but um, there is no risk on, on meditation. Um, so I recommend it. And, but at the same time, meditation is not for everybody. Um, so... I, I will recommend just trying a uh, meditation just a few minutes and uh, starting with um, not go very specific into whatever tool you use, you know, Headspace or others, but don't go, if you're new to meditation, there are kind of, we have like basic packs or go through really understanding what is meditation, what this is for. And then the most important thing, it's like, let's not get obsessed if you're doing it right, or it's, it just, you're going to see the effects after doing it for, you know, for a while, for a few uh, days. So don't, don't obsess with, you know, hey, I'm doing it right. It's just 
go with it and whatever setting works for you. And I mean, in the morning it's ideal, but for example, I don't do it in the morning. For me, it works better in the evening. So it really depends on whatever your routine is and whatever works best for you. Um, but just, again, there is no risk of, of trying meditation. But whenever you're doing it, I think it's important that you have to be kind of in a quiet uh, space. You have to be in the right mindset. You have to be kind of in the right position and then give it a try. Of course, it's not just about closing your eyes and keep thinking about, you know, all oh, what's going on or just keep listening to the TV. Um, it's just about doing doing the exercise, but don't get obsessed of, am I doing it right or not? I have a lot of friends new to meditation that it's like, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, no, just it's about learning techniques. And, and for us, even there are a lot of people that you've used Headspace for a while and now they meditate themselves and that's, that's fine. So I just, you know, I just want to make sure that whatever works best for you and it's a very, it, there is no risk. It, this is the, the beauty of meditation versus, you know, other solutions. And well, maybe do you have other relaxation techniques that you recommend your patients that you can share with us? Uh, we, I, I can tell you, basically we use uh, meditation and, and, and I agree, uh, reducing the stress uh, of the people through this tool and, uh, is very important. And the question is, uh, we have different uh, people with highly and difficult uh, uh, mental health problems, but even for them, mindfulness is, is a great tool. That's, that's the, the question, because sometimes there are uh, more sophisticated tools, but doesn't work. No? I think in the, in the future, the devices they are developing, and maybe uh, we can talk about this, I think they are very uh, interesting for the near future or just in the future. We basi basically, uh, nowadays, we are introducing the, the, the mindfulness for one year, one year, two years uh, before. We're working with executives, and this is very good because if we understand now the, the economical issues around the, the crisis, actual crisis, they need, and we are working with them in the in the business business schools because they need uh, to prevent their burnout. The same as in the in the in the in the care health care givers. Uh, the, statistic, the statistics now say in the in the in the field of healthcare, the 50% now is on depression, uh, they connected the, the, the front, front line, and with anxiety and insomnia and distress. So it's basically the, the, the good focus for mindfulness. So uh, I would say that for all the populations, maybe some kind of schizophrenic, but even with them, we, we have good results. I would say it's very, it's very, it's very useful more than, than the cognitive and interventions and the, and the, as we said, emotional interventions and behavioral interventions and pharmacology. Okay. Um, so I have uh, yeah, two other questions that are quite uh, related about working from home. Um, so the situation at the moment is that people are working from home, like the, the team are just like spread around, everybody in their houses. So what can the companies do to have the employees to stay mentally healthy during this period. So do you have maybe like tips to share with your em employers? So uh, if you want, I can add something on this. When we basically is a distributed company from day one and uh, we got staff uh, in Madrid, in the UK, in France, in Mexico, and uh, in Argentina. So we're ready to be uh, spread around now. Uh, our best practices generally is communication. Is uh, maintaining a communication uh, channel open, uh, not in a way that you know it oversaturated and people like feel like they are always on, but uh, you know be available as much as is possible for your colleagues. Uh, maybe they want you know to have a virtual coffee. Or they are, I this Swedish called the kiffen, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, a friend of mine uh, that has a, a similar activity in the States, uh, for example, they use an iPad, no? Each of the staff members have an iPad uh, sitting next to the laptop, and it's always on, and they're always in a, uh, in a virtual room. So the cameras are off, 
But in the moment in which somebody wants to talk to you, they just ping you and say, hey, you know, uh, Alina, uh, can you chat five minutes? And you just turn on uh, the camera and the mic. So it gives, uh, it gives uh, that impression that you're not alone, that your team members are there even if, uh, uh, if you're not. No? And uh, uh, one of the, the comments that we receive uh, uh, from some clients that are having difficulties adopting this new type of, uh, of work setting is uh, a, the vast um, increase in meetings. No? Obviously, in uh, meetings, uh, messages, communications, people feel like they're spending 10 hours are they on the phone? They're basically not stopping, you know? And uh, as well as uh, it's perhaps uh, of use of uh, uh, having your uh, boundaries. So maybe like training your team on having the boundaries. That, you know, it's okay as well, like being there for your colleagues, but if you feel that, you know, you cannot pull from an empty cup, if you feel that your cup is, uh, is filling up, as well going back to work. And uh, I say, you know, I'm, work, I'm doing a piece of work right now and I do communication from a, a certain time or like that's a, way, a, a slot in which I'm, uh, I'm more available. You know? So if is it possible, you know, uh, let's try to communicate within a certain set time of, uh, of hours. The reality is there are several formulas uh, and the one that works best, uh, uh, it really depends on the DNA of, uh, of each organization. Yeah, to, to, yeah, I want to I wanna add on that. Um, what, what we do, that it's working really good. And again, I know this is kind of in California, it's a different style. It's way more kind of uh, based on objectives rather than how many hours you work. Um, but what we do, it's, it's two things. So one is um, when this started, we just look at our schedules, everyone being mindful of, hey, how is our life? So for example, now, and in one case, is some, some people on the team, I cannot start working until 10 because I need to be with my kids or like Ricardo said, maybe in the afternoon, I need to be in the kids. So just respect this and whatever time schedule work best for, for everybody. Because if not, again, if your kids are, you know, right here, and again, this is depending on every situation, but if you can just work around, you know, the schedules of, of everybody and just being very clear about what are the objectives and how we're going to divide and conquer and how we're going to measure uh, everybody's work. And then at the same time, we're looking at all the schedules. We kind of found two spots. Every day we have like a daily stand-up, which is very common in, in kind of tech companies, but daily stand-up with all of us, we do a quick, you know, 30 second update what we're working on. And then, which I think this is great, every day for us at 3 p.m., we have kind of 30 minutes of virtual social time where we see kids and dogs and, you know, it's like our coffee time. Um, so definitely, again, not maybe you cannot join every day, but it's a time to hang out with, you know, with your colleagues and, and live with the situation. Everyone is on this. It's not just you. So, yeah, I think this is working pretty well because then, People understand, hey, it's not just me in this situation. Everybody's living with the same situation. Everybody understands that maybe you have your kids or maybe you don't or maybe, you know, you have a pet or whatever your situation is. And just be mindful of that and, you know, very clear objectives and not – I think we should not expect for, you know – um people to work in the same schedule and, you know, and in this, this is a different situation and we just have to, uh, to be mindful of that. Okay. Um, it, now, uh, I, yeah, Manuel. I just, uh, I agree. Different schedules is basic for different people. So we adapt uh, we have uh, present people and people who is working at home. So we manage uh, depending on every situation, every family has, different uh, necessities so, so we adapt our staff uh, to work on every week or every 15 days so even they don't they have to stay at home and other people uh, are able to be presential and and we understand the situations that prevent the burnout with the people and i would say the using humor is very important in this way as uh, as a mature mechanism of defense. No? Uh, sometimes it's difficult, but it's a way to interact. And we, we need time to, to introduce a sense of humor, not only with the patients, but with the, with the staff 
and with our families, of course. No? Absolutely, yeah. So now, so we are, um, we've got like 10 minutes left. I would like to talk a bit about the healthcare professionals. So Manuel, you, you, you mentioned them before. So the, the mental health is very important for them, like down the front line, they are, they're getting a lot out of the situation. And I think there's also the psychologist, the psychiatrist like, like yourself. You are dealing with, with people on a regular basis who are not feeling well. So you're absorbing uh, those feelings from those people. So what can we do to help those healthcare professionals and those like psychiatrists, psychologists? Well, uh, everybody, I would say that we are kind of an alphabet in, in emotional intelligence. No? That's, that's one of the difficulties. We are uh, trying in, uh, for a long time to introduce in the uh, curriculum scholar managing emotions uh, for people from 10 years old and from 16. So uh, that, that, that has to be one of the issues for continuing working. No? Uh, we know that, as we said before, projecting our emotions to the other people is it's, it's, it's part of the daily uh, situation. No? Uh, in terms of uh, accept our vulnerability, vulnerability for us is important, not only for, for the general people, but for the professionals too. Uh, we have difficulties in, in emotionally aspects, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and whoever. No? So, so the way to work is uh, use our tools that we are uh, teaching every, every day and try, uh, as Roberto said, to, to teach to the other people uh, through the, the, the appointments or demand that they have uh, around us. Uh, uh, I would say with basically with the people who who has have a very bad situations, who has lost uh, a family, that, that they are not being able to to work and say goodbye and the duelo. Uh, that's uh, very very bad situations. Then probably they will need uh, in the near future uh, treat the, the post traumatic stress disorder that in some ways. Uh, many people are going to, to have, like it's happening in, in another catastrophes. Uh, working with EMDR, uh, different tools uh, will be in the near future part of the, of the, of the working and, and the, the key solution and the needs that people are starting to, to, to have. Uh, and maybe working and understanding the, the emotional intelligence is, is one of the most important in terms of the Howard Gardner issue that different uh, intelligence will be the time to, to take part, not for increase the, the healthcare resources in public and private, but in terms of mental health to, to work more and, and be, be, be uh, able to understand that it's, it's a main uh, important for our society. Okay. Pablo, maybe you want to add something because you mentioned that you are working with uh, healthcare professionals. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, totally. Um, well, Headspace, it's already being kind of um, recommended and referred by many healthcare professionals, not just in the US and in Europe, fully integrated in behavioral health settings and in primary care. And, and because of we work very close with healthcare professionals now, we're living in you know in kind of such tough situations, so that we kind of unlocked all the content we have over a thousand hours of content, content for like I said, stress, anxiety, but also for you know um, dealing with pain and content for your kids and content for so all the content that we develop, it's completely available for free to healthcare professionals because we want to support healthcare professionals during this kind of uh, challenging times and and then they also even the more you know even the, some of the skeptical ones now they are trying you know and meditation and, and other mindfulness techniques and and also if they benefit themselves and they see you know kind of uh, the power of of mindfulness and meditation even the more skeptical ones they're more likely then they also recommend it to patients so patients can also benefit from 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 the interventions and 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 i think it's it's working pretty good and like i said it's not for everybody but but we've seen and we also have studies with not just with patient populations, but but with healthcare professionals. 
So and 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 yeah, and it's and it's working, and and I'm glad that we can we can support them. So we we launched this initiative in the U.S. We we launched it also in in the NHS, and and we're looking to to expand this to to other countries since we need, of course, a verification system uh, in place. In how many languages is your platform uh, or your app available? Uh, it's in five: so Spanish, English, German, French, and Portuguese. Okay. Great. Um, Alberto, Ricardo, do you want to add, to add something to that? Um, yeah, I mean, not much to everything that's been said. We identified this particular population as a high risk for um, um, affective disorders um, during the um, uh, pandemic for, for two reasons. The, the first one is um, exposure. Um, they not only have to see firsthand the devastating effects of the virus, but also they are exposed to a higher viral load, so they're more likely to be infected. In Italy, the mortality rate in um, frontline healthcare workers is 12%. In Spain, it's about 10%. So it's really, really serious. And the other thing is lack of resources. Um, this pandemic has caught most governments unprepared for it and people are being sent to deal with this infection without personal protective equipment and, 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 and the majority of the task force are on very, very low salaries for the, the work that they do. So we thought that the combination of these elements will render them very, very vulnerable to um, emotional problems and adjustment disorders following the pandemic. And, and that's why we launched the um, um, Cuidate en Casa and the Stay Strong at Home campaign. This is a, a clinical network of psychologists offering a thousand um, sessions for free to support the work that they do. So, so um, yeah, it's, um, um, it's, 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 a, it's a highly vulnerable population, yeah. I mean, that's something's been amazing to see all the initiatives that, that popped up um th those past weeks and days to to support the population and uh yeah i think that's really really amazing um uh, okay we've got just a few minutes i'm gonna ask the last question to you like a brief question um uh, manuel you you mentioned before that there may be some consequences to that to that situation so if we look uh maybe a year from now what can we do today to to prepare for the the, the future to leave the confinement to leave the crisis and to to be better prepared for the the coming month well uh, to bring, we don't know which uh, which situation we will have in the near future so the, the first idea is uh, uh, to be able to understand that uh, in the past we have uh, many crises so this is not one uh, in terms of economics and from 1992 and 12 uh, and uh, it's so we we can be prepared and to learn about what's it's going on so so see that preparing in the in terms of public uh, funds as we said before for for healthcare uh, it's one of the um, priorities maybe as a, as a government as a, our politics we have and in, in terms of population, uh, if we care more about yourself and we introduce uh, the tools, as well, we were saying, like like uh, uh, starting more uh, connected with us through the socializing, through the through mindfulness, and um, we care with our emotional intelligence. Maybe the first step to change the, change the things, no? but be able to that, that say that uh, forty percent of our happiness depends on us. And depending on us, uh, understanding that uh, the studies say that if, if you help uh, uh, somebody, your happiness increases if, if you help yourself. So that doesn't mean you don't have to help yourself, but you, you, you can connect much more and understanding that uh, it can happen, but if it happens, uh, it don't have to be the, the, the worst scenario. But uh, even in that situation, we can manage and we try to work and, and to benefit of our experience. Anyone else want to comment on that? I have, well, um, 
I think that we we now have a first wave of 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 this um, um, epidemic in which we're gonna see a lot of um, casualties and a lot of lethality um, directly um, from the virus. But I think there's also uh, at least two or three waves that are coming after this, which we're not considering now because we're so tangled up with what's happening that we're probably not preparing for what's coming. The second one is going to be people that suffer from um, serious conditions that um, are treatable if they are diagnosed early. For instance, people with colon cancers or breast cancers or um, other disorders that require early diagnosis and assertive treatment. These people are not being prioritized right now because the resources are directed towards treating people that are infected with COVID-19. So the delay in diagnosis and the delay in treatment will result in an increase uh, mortality in this population. After this, we will be, as a society, submerged in, if not in a depression, certainly in a recession of the economy. And then people with chronic disorders will suffer. They will be deprioritized from health services. Um, people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or with um, lupus or with uh, multiple sclerosis, um, they will see the services that they receive in terms of social support can cut down and funding being redirected to hospitals to treat acute conditions. And then we have a fourth wave of mental illness. And as Manuel was saying earlier, this will affect people differently depending on which uh, diagnostic category um, they are. So, for instance, you know, people with pre-existing problems of anxiety and depression will see the, um, the problems um, increased. And the risk, of course, is suicide. People with psychotic disorders will suffer from quarantine, particularly, and, and from persecutory delusions and delusions of control. Other people like, for instance, people with catatonic um, um, psychosis or with, um, um, I don't know, um, eating disorders, for instance, might be affected, but not as badly. So I think healthcare services will have to go one by one through all the diagnostic categories and, and prepare for contingency plans for what's coming, because it, it will come, it is coming. Aline, if you don't mind, however, I want to finish with one thing. The most important thing that I think we said today, it was said by Manuel, keep the sense of humor. So I have one of my best friends that said, now it's so exciting to go out and throw the garbage. It's like so exciting. <laughs> so keep the sense of humor because I think this is crucial during these times. I have, I have agree. And, and the sense of perspective as well. You know, there is always a light uh, at the end of the tunnel and uh, we're starting to get the, the first one. So just quickly, you wanted to add on, uh, on uh, Ricardo and Manuel in terms of waves, uh, a way probably that's going to increase uh, in, uh, mental health support need. It's probably going to be the impact on the economic uh, on the economy. Uh, no matter what, you know, uh, is, is, is a comment that goes wanted to be just before the one of Pablo. So uh, now it's is made, and I just go back to let's keep the sense of humor, exactly, uh, a smile on our face, and uh, and uh, we recover of this. Uh, that's for sure. Yes, and there is hope. Absolutely, there is hope too. To 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 win the situation and, and to prepare for 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 any kind of situation we have we have demonstrated in the past and we have the tools but mental health is very important and we, we should really like take that into consideration if you are not feeling well like seek advice you know like uh Sayus are offering that that platform where you can get three hours with psychologists like future health club also launched their initiative those past days there's things out there. There's, you, you can do mindfulness, you can do other, you do exercise, just go on YouTube, do exercises. But it's very, very important. And yeah. I'm laughing, keep joking, and uh, everything is going to be fine. And so you thank, you your team. <laughs> thank you very much for, for, for joining us today, for sharing your, your expertise on this very interesting topic. Thanks, everybody, for, for also joining the, the live event today, for asking questions. We'll be back next week. Uh, the, the next event will be on the 14th of April, the Tuesday. So we come back right after Easter. And this event will be in, in Spanish next time. And we do it. It's an event organized by uh, Circulo uh, uh, Equestre, a club from here from Barcelona in collaboration with Barcelona Health Hub. And we're going to talk about the impact of digital health in the, in the actual sector. So we, we're going to have... Um, 
Novartis, uh, DKV, uh, like an um, uh, insurance company, uh, Dr. Alia, and uh, uh, a doctor from a, a hospital here in uh, um, Barcelona. So next week, 14th at 7 p.m. It's a bit later. Thank you very much for attending, everybody. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Alina. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.